Do you want to come with me? Because if you do, then I should warn you. When Doctor Who was revived by the BBC and executive producer Russell T Davis in 2005, the series soon became associated with South Wales, and in particular, Cardiff, thanks to production being based there, alongside the presence of many recognisable Cardiff locations and South Wales landmarks used for filming. The association was accelerated by the fact that a number of episodes were set or partially set there, alongside popular spin-off series Torchwood, which was set entirely in Cardiff. Acknowledging this, there was, until 2017, an exhibition in the city featuring props from both the original and the revival series. And following the death of spin-off character Yanto Jones, fans erected a memorial at Roald Dahl Plaza. Similar in style to those of rock stars such as Mark Bolin and Jim Morrison. This has since become a permanent fixture and is ranked as 44th out of 185 things to do in Cardiff on TripAdvisor. Yet, whilst recent associations between the series and Wales have been celebrated, less acknowledged is the fact that a relationship between the two, between Doctor Who and Wales, goes back almost as far as the creation of the series in 1963. For example, Terry Nation, creator of the Daleks, was born in Clondaff, Cardiff, in 1930. The series also filmed in Wales on a number of occasions, most notably for the 20th anniversary of the series in 1983. In total, filming in Wales contributed to 24 individual episodes, or six stories total, and these utilised a diverse range of locations, including a holiday camp, a chemical works, and Port Merriam. Today I will be examining the first of these filming expeditions into Wales. This was a significant milestone for both Doctor Who and for filming in Wales, and North Wales in particular, in general. The expedition was for an ambitious six-part story, The Abominable Snowman and it would see the Valley of Nam Frankon playing the role of a mountainous region of Tibet. All barring one episode of this story has been lost, despite the fact that it was to be a significant set of episodes in the series history, setting a precedent for impressive and ambitious location-based stories. In terms of North Wales-based productions, it was, overall, a comparatively minor one. Yet, it heralded the use of the area as a significant location for science fiction, fantasy and horror themed productions, which today are a staple of filming in the area. Abominable Snowmen was a milestone, not just for Doctor Who's relationship with Wales, but alongside The Prisoner, which premiered the same week as this story, for science fiction and fantasy filming in the area. The story sees the Doctor and his friends Jamie and Victoria fight robotic yeti attacking a Tibetan monastery, and it was the second story of the series' fifth season. It's worth briefly taking a moment to establish how the series had progressed and developed up to this point. From a production standpoint, the series was at a creative peak. Writing in a special issue of Doctor Who magazine, Philip MacDonald commented that season five has been upheld by fans as the pinnacle of 1960s Doctor Who, and that the casting, design, and production values were uniformly high. The prior fourth season of the series had been pivotal for the programme, seeing the departure of original Doctor William Hartnell due to ill health, and the introduction of Patrick Troughton as a completely different interpretation of the central character. At this time, this change of actor was a complete gamble, and whilst the move was ultimately successful, it at first received a mixed reception from viewers. G. Howard of Leeds reckoned that it had dragged the programme out of the unfortunate mess it had degenerated into, whilst Mrs. Estelle Hawkin of Cornwall asked why turn a wonderful series into what looked like Coco the Clown, lamenting that Thousands of children would stop watching the series as a result. She was wrong. Average ratings for the series nearly doubled as a result of the new actor, rising from around 4 million viewers per episode 
to around 7 or 8 million. Though this would not be the high point of the series' popularity, during Tom Baker's time as the Doctor, the series would regularly attract upwards of 13 million viewers. Patrick Troughton's time as the Doctor would still be fondly remembered by both fans of the series and the general public. This episode in particular was recalled by Stephen Baxter in his introduction to a reprint of a 1974 novelisation of this story. Baxter states that, I recall vivid images and scenes from the show. In this case, the brooding mountaintop monastery, the enigmatic monks, the mixture of strange monsters and alien high-tech, the unfolding mystery. Before, he went on to state that it was a highlight of Patrick Troughton's second year as the Doctor. The series was still comparatively low budget, especially in comparison to similar fare being produced contemporaneously. We can only estimate how much it cost to produce at the time, as there is no budget evidence available, but according to series director Warris Hussein, who directed the first produced story, An Unearthly Child, that had cost around £1,000 per episode, and the budget for this series would likely not have been any great deal higher. An estimate of around twelve to thirteen thousand pounds for all six episodes is likely to be accurate, however. When we compare this to other science fiction fantasy series of the period, we can see how low this is. The Prisoner, for example, had a budget of seventy five thousand pounds per episode. Due to the low budget, this has led to the perception that the original run of Doctor Who had shockingly shonky production values, and there is a common held belief that the sets were made of cardboard and the monsters were made of tinfoil. Whilst this is partially true in a number of cases, and whilst some of the series has most definitely not aged well, the series makers often aspired towards as high production values as they could despite the low budget. On occasion, these aspirations paid off, with results that, even today, look convincing and impressive. Such examples include a Dalek emerging from beneath the waters of the River Thames, and another story, also concerning Yeti, this time on the London Underground, with a purpose-built set so convincing that it allegedly caused London Transport to complain that the BBC had been filming on the Underground without permission. Rather than constrain the series, the low budget forced the programme makers to think outside the box and to produce what was, for the time, innovative and ambitious television. Part of this innovation was in the way the series utilised and used location. Similar to the production values, this is something which modern folklore has boiled down to quarry in Buckinghamshire. Whilst this is once more true to a tiny extent, the program makers actually went to enormous lengths to seek out locations that were unusual or different, resulting in stories and episodes which were remembered and held in high esteem by both the cast and fans long afterwards. Though the series had done minimal location shooting around London before the production of Abominable Snowmen, including at Gatwick Airport earlier in 1967, the filming expedition to North Wales was to be the production team's grandest and most ambitious undertaking up to that point, covering six days from the 4th to the 9th of September 1967, and it is evidence that the series was growing in confidence in what it could achieve and what it could create. By the late 1970s, the production team had become ambitious enough to begin filming abroad in places such as Paris, Seville and Amsterdam. A significant number of these episodes are held in high esteem by fans. The story set in Paris, City of Death, for example, would see the series reach a ratings high of 16 million viewers, a feat which has yet to be surpassed, and the story is still regarded as a high point of the series. Abominable was to be the precedent upon which all of this ambitious location work was based. Though sadly, five of the six episodes no longer exist in the archives, as I mentioned. For 1960s Doctor Who, 
alongside other popular series produced at the time, such as Adam, Adam and Lives. This is not unusual. Currently, a total of 97 episodes remain absent from the archives, only existing in the form of off-air audio recordings and telesnaps, still photographs of selective scenes. The loss of these episodes happened for a number of reasons, but principal amongst them is the perceived commercial value of the series at the time of its production. The BBC in this period had no film archive, and master tapes were kept by the engineering department, while copies for the purpose of international and commercial sales were kept by BBC Enterprises. With the advent of colour television towards the end of the 1960s, the commercial value of the series black and white episodes decreased significantly, and alongside the limited storage space and the expiration of repeat rights, the BBC came to the decision to destroy, or else wipe and reuse, all of the series master tapes, as well as any copies of episodes that no longer had any international value. Doctor Who's destruction began on the 9th of March 1967, when the master tapes for the then recently broadcast story, The Highlanders, were destroyed, and this destruction continued up until 1978, when it became possible to release the series on videotape. The master tape for episode 4 of Abominable was destroyed on the 17th of July 1969, with episodes 1 and 2 following on the 22nd of September. The final episodes followed on the 25th. BBC Enterprises destroyed the commercial copies in 1974, while copies sent to Australia were returned to the BBC and presumably also destroyed one year later. Other copies sent to Gibraltar, Nigeria, Hong Kong, New Zealand, Zambia and Singapore were either returned, destroyed or lost by the stations which bought them. The second episode was rediscovered by chance in 1982 when BBC film editor Roger Stevens began talking to a BBC film projectionist who revealed he had Doctor Who episodes for sale, amongst them an episode of Abominable Snowmen. Sadly, this all means that determining how the story actually used the landscape of North Wales is difficult, although not impossible. The surviving episode only used location footage for about half the episode, limited to a few short scenes, and these mostly consisted of undistinguished close-ups. The surviving episode is not, therefore, by any means the best source for showing how ambitious the production was in its use of the landscape. However, we also have a large number of telesnaps of the location work for the missing episodes, as well as behind the scenes photographs. Even the location itself can provide us with a resource for determining how the production used the landscape. There is also the novelization of the story written in 1974 Though author Terence Dix used a considerable amount of imagination in his retelling, and thus it has very limited value as a resource for understanding this story as it appeared on television. Location shooting took place entirely within the valley of Nam Francon. Specifically, we can see from this behind the scenes photograph the southern end of the valley close to what is now the Ogwen car park. The intention of the production team had been to film somewhere with snow, and they chose Snowdonia, hoping for the right conditions. However, they were filming far too early in the year for snow, and so the desired effect was not achieved on television. The 1974 novelisation resurrected the idea, and is much more Himalayan than Snowdonian. It describes the TARDIS landing on a snowy plateau amid snowy wastes, all of which are definitely not apparent in the surviving material. Mount Francon is also not as remote as the story would have us believe. Being within a moderate walking distance of the nearest town, Bethesda, it once formed a major part of the route between Bethesda and Betasy Coid and the road along the west side of the valley, which is still accessible to traffic, was originally constructed by Richard Pennant, Lord Penryn, 
at some time in the late 18th century. It was to provide access to the slate quarry at Bethesda, and it was superseded by Thomas Telford's A5 road on the east side of the valley. There's also evidence of an earlier route through the valley in the form of a Roman bridge, near to which filming for the Inn of the Sixth Happiness took place in the summer of 1958. The southern end of the valley, close to the filming location, was also used in World War II, and a line of concrete tank traps were used as a border checkpoint in a 1965 episode of the ITC series Danger Man. Interestingly, Danger Man shows the line of traps as complete, whilst today there is a large section of the line which has been removed. Unfortunately, the Doctor Who production team does not appear to have shot this far down the valley, so it's unclear if they were removed prior to 1967. For the most part, the story appears to have been shot facing south, focusing on the ridge of Penibenglog, which separates the valley from Cum Edwal. One feature of the ridge was prominently used in the story as a secret cave where the Yeti nest was located. In reality, this is little more than a cleft in the rock, though by shooting it from a specific angle, the production was able to make it appear as though the cleft was actually a cave. Considerable effort must have been undertaken here. The cleft itself is quite high above the valley, approximately 197 feet above the level of the road. Actress Deborah Watling, who played Victoria, revisiting the location for a radio feature, recounted that the cleft was obstinately perched halfway up the hill and that the hillside was very steep. This is most definitely true and the cleft is in no way easy to reach, especially in poor weather. So getting both actors, crew and filming equipment up there would surely have presented a significant difficulty. So it's no surprise that, as Watling mentions, one of the Yeti actors in full costume slipped, rolled and began to gather momentum until it shot straight past them like a speeding furball. As well as this cleft, the story made significant use of the scenery, especially in episodes 1, 2 and 4, with episode 4 appearing to have been the most prominent. The second episode, the surviving episode, exclusively used the cleft and the ridge of Penibenglog, so it's not ideal evidence for how the location was used. Telesnaps and stills of other episodes are better suited to this. In the first episode, one shot, albeit shown through the TARDIS scanner, depicted the Doctor walking through the valley with the Ogwen River visible in shot. A much wider image, shot from the same direction and showing the entire valley appeared in episode 4. Other telesnaps show that there were a limited number of shots facing east. The production team mostly avoided these due to the presence of farm buildings. One shot that was taken from this direction, from episode 4, has a large yeti placed in precisely the right position to obscure the farmhouse. What becomes clear when we look at both the telesnaps and the surviving episode is that the production team made significant use of their time in North Wales, and they didn't let something as trivial as a lack of snow hamper their ambitions for the story. At the time, when television production was still predominantly studio-based, the location work must have appeared impressive, and especially effective to the audience. Certainly, Doctor Who's use of Snowdonia to represent the Himalaya is far more convincing than Carry On at the Khyber's similar attempt one year later. The chances of this story being fully recovered are unlikely, though not impossible. We can therefore only have again a limited understanding of how the production used Nam Francon and transformed it into Tibet. However, from the surviving material, we can see that in common with the series' aspirations towards high production values, and given the budget, that this filming expedition was highly ambitious, yielding significant and impressive results. In recent times, 
Snowdonia has become a location of choice for science fiction and fantasy filming. Dinorwig Quarry, on the opposite side of the Glitter Range, to now Francon, has been used in Hollywood blockbusters like Tomb Raider and Clash of the Titans. The Abominable Snowman was amongst the first science fiction stories to be shot in North Wales. And as we've seen, it also made considerable use of its location. It set a precedent, not just for Doctor Who's future filming endeavours, but for science fiction and fantasy filming in North Wales. The presence of Yeti in the Glitters, therefore, marks an important milestone in the history of film and television production in North Wales. History! It's a thing of the past! It's a thing of the past.